this is a uh, for me a uh, very special, and I always say that uh, if you watch all my shows, but it is special because uh, I'm uh, I'm with Bilal Mashani, and and Bilal is a fellow journalist student, and 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 that means a lot to me, and and of course we met. In, in in the marvelous wonderful world of LinkedIn and things come together and and uh, we met um, I don't know in December LinkedIn and the commonalities and of course Bilal is uh, a student at Rutgers studying journalism the official uh, title for this interview uh, basically is visual and, and broadcast journalists. So uh, I'm done. <laughs> a little bit of an intro. So uh, Bilal, I think maybe just do a, a quick little bio of yourself and then we're going to jump yeah. into some what I find to be really interesting. Of course. So as you said, I am a broadcast journalist and visual journalist. I've been working in the industry for, wow, almost almost a decade now. And I started very young, and it's always been a passion of mine. And my expertise lies in uh, photojournalism, video journalism, and broadcast journalism. So I traveled the country uh, taking photos of major events. Um, political events, either interviewing uh, political figures such as senators and lobbyists, even presidential candidates on the trail. Oh. Um, I've uh, covered uh, cultural events across the United States, and I it's, it's a labor of love. I've been, there's nothing else I'd rather do. I get to meet the most amazing people and see the most amazing things, and I get to write about it. I get to... Uh, to experience it firsthand and there's not nothing better in the world than that i'd say and like you said rockers university rockers newark um proud student um if it wasn't for rockers i don't know where i'd be the professors there really are the the backbone of my studies i'd say because like the the kind of community that there's very collaborative Correct. And I've learned so much and used it as kind of like a kickstart for my career. And if it wasn't for what I learned in university, I don't know what I'd be doing. You know, I need to remind the listeners, you're a sophomore. And, and, and I'm, I'm a, a junior. Junior, actually. Yep. Junior. junior. Okay. Junior. Okay, yep. so you're finishing really soon. <laughs> okay, so you're a junior, but my point was, you know, uh, Tom Brokaw just retired. Yeah, I saw that. You saw that 55 years journalist, uh, and, and so you're a junior. Uh, and and the other point I wanted to make is flashing across the screen will be uh, points of contact where people will be able to see some of your photojournalism, correct? Yep, that's correct. And that's important. Uh, so uh, let's let's go into the the substantive part. Uh, <laughs> and let me ask you some questions. Um, Perfect. Uh, All ears. Yes. So uh, officially, what is your your current major at Rutgers? So officially, I am a double major in video production with a concentration in documentary and live video. And my other major is in uh, journalism and media studies. Yep. Mm -hmm. no. Two very big things. That in oh, my, they're big. Yeah. They're, they're so related, but so different. But I just love how both of them kind of combined together in the most beautiful way you know uh um the world of documentary is is one of the most wonderful worlds uh it, it yep has absorbed, absolutely fascinating it has absorbed me for the last several years uh, obsessively yep. there's some know. things which you can only show 
in a visual form. Like sometimes seeing is believing with a lot of things like like if like you could tell somebody you could describe somebody a Ken Burns film, but unless they sit and watch a Ken Burns film, they're not gonna get it. It it you have to see the actual oh, you got there's the emotion it. aspect, there's the the visual aspect. It's it's an art form and it's kind of like it's a learning form. It's a mode of learning. That's, it's, it's a wonderful that's mode of learning. Uh, I, I've, re I've, I've I've become such a huge fan of, of Ken Burns, and somehow I feel I know Peter Coyote because he's usually a narrator. Mm -hmm. And 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 I can't tell you how many times I've watched Vietnam. Probably yeah. uh, over uh, over ten times the whole document why because i lived it and where did i live it at rutgers newark as a matter of fact um another uh, anyway um moving on i don't want to drift away so what is your official uh, officially what is your uh, like your current career so in terms of career um i work as a freelance photojournalist stringer so i sell my photos um to news organizations right. and i uh, conduct live broadcasts um, for contracts. Um, I work with the university um, for uh, certain events. And outside of that, it's just, it's a 24 seven job of always looking at the news ticker, always seeing what's happening and always trying to figure out what's going on. This next question is, is a favorite for me. Um, we, we've kind of discussed this off camera when we chatted. Um, but uh, take it away. Who, who is your, your, your biggest influence? Okay. <laughs> so, wow. yeah. Um, my biggest influence was, as a kid, I used to... You, you would ask anybody that knew me as a kid, anybody that knew me, my mother, my father, my uncles, anybody. I used to, every Sunday morning, used to watch Meet the Press with Tim Russert. Wow. was my number one thing. Like, no, no uh, weekend uh, cartoons or wacky races. It was always, wow. had to watch Meet the Press. By the way, you were a little and, kid, weren't you? When you oh, were yeah, yeah. I was, <laughs> I was a little kid. Yeah. And I think I was nine when he passed away, actually. So it was, it was young. So like when I was like four or five, even starting and yeah, it was during the, the Bush election is when I started watching. Um, I used to say Florida, Florida, Florida all the time. <laughs> it was my little catchphrase, I guess, but he was definitely one of my biggest influences because it was something about the demeanor of that type of everyday man type of person that somebody you could see on the street and then like hear like that type of perspective on it. And it's just something that's kind of stuck with me. So the thing I dislike about some journalists is the whole holier than thou type of feeling where like like a separate class or a different echelon of person where journalism is supposed to be the voice of the people for the people by the people and that's what i liked about it and that's what i still kind of look up to because you see figures like that like uh tim russer who were people who embodied the normal working man spirit like like if you just looked at him you'd be like oh that's just a guy from the guy from buffalo or and that was probably my biggest inspiration as a budding journalist. Okay. Did any one event uh, help to kickstart your journalism career? Yes, actually. Um, where for the biggest, like in terms of like profitable journalism, of like active journalism of like going out and selling stuff or doing like articles for actual publication was four years ago during the um 
right after the uh, Trump election. Um, I attended the and the uh, the women's march, and that was the first large scale event that I that I did. Because up until then, I was doing like little like town articles, which there's nothing wrong with. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with small local journalism. That's the backbone of journalism, sure. small local journalism, because that's what's really affecting the people. Like the stuff from up top kind of eventually trickles all the way down. And unfortunately, it's kind of overlooked. But anyway, sorry, went off a little tangent. But that's up fine. until then, I was working on little articles and photos for different events happening near me in North Jersey. But that was the first like wide scale news event that I covered, and it was kind of like in, in kind of like a eyes wide like eyes opening type of thing. Like I s photographed the event, I interviewed people, I talked with leaders. I it was that was my first event, and it hasn't stopped since. Okay. Uh, um. I don't usually ask, um, but I'm just curious, um, has your work life changed during COVID or like almost? Oh like yeah, of course. Of course it's changed. It's everything is turned upside down with this because COVID was one of the biggest events that it's the biggest event that's happened in my lifetime. We're having cataclysmic amounts of deaths daily. It's horrible. We're having one 9-11 a day, and that's horrifying. And mm -hmm. it's changed the journalism industry completely. Anybody could see this if you look on the TV. You see people doing it from their homes. You see uh, everybody obviously wearing masks. So most of my stuff has turned to COVID, as with the entire world. Um, I've seen a lot of changes happening and it's, while it's interesting, while we're getting more people working from home, which is something that should, I think personally should have been done a while ago. There's a lot of things that could have been conducted online. I can't tell you how many in-person meetings could have just been done over an email. <laughs> so, um, that's changed the whole working in person thing for some of my work. But I'm still going out during COVID to take photos and videos and to report. And it's scary. I got COVID uh, while I was reporting. Oh. I had to quarantine. Thankfully, nobody else got sick and I'm fine. But it's something that's happening. Like, I have to risk my body to actually conduct journalism. And... While I'm thankful that uh, journalists are in the, um, the essential workers group for uh, the COVID vaccine, it can't come soon enough. That, but there is so much demand, so little supply. So it's a waiting game. It's interesting. You know, uh, my journalism, which was a huge asterisk, I, I did what I wanted to do for NJ Discover. I, you and I talked about it, um, and 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 I've got a quarter of a million pictures in my files that I've taken over the years. Wonderful pictures that I've kind of brought out and and, mm -hmm. and, and kind of re re show them um, with explanations. Um, but this this format was born. You you and I. Uh, this this interview format was born in August uh, because I I I I miss doing what I had been doing for ten years, and so in, in some small way, uh, and and I kind of like it, you know. I don't have to uh, drive up on the parkway and turnpike anymore. Yeah, <laughs> sitting right here, um, I'm actually. Uh, when I'm not saying this on air, I'm, I'm actually wearing my pajamas. I did my tour <laughs> workout before, took a shower before you and I went on air, and threw on my pajamas. You'll never 14 know. Fourteen casual. <laughs> You'll never know. Uh, yep. So, um, 
let's just go off topic a, a quick second. Yeah. Um, and 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 I always like to do a little cerebral. So here's the um, here's one of my cerebral uh, questions to you: uh, Living or dead, ex excluding uh, uh, family, family, friends. Yeah, living yeah. or dead, who'd you like to spend a day with? Ooh. Wow, that's an interesting one. See, that's a question that everybody always asks, but I'm never prepared to answer because that's a question everybody has. Like, oh, who would you have one dinner with? But like, the question changes so often. I bet it does. Um, you could throw in a couple. I believe. So, I think one of them would be Woody Guthrie. Is one of them? I no. think. Wow. I think that he was a fascinating oh, wow. person who has really influenced, who continues to influence a lot of current day uh, politics. Um, wow, I have to think a little. Um, you know, they sang his song at the inauguration. Yeah. The other yeah. There, there was a little controversy over it that uh -huh. uh, I saw, but there's controversy in everything. Um, <laughs> hmm. That's a great answer. I, th I think I'd have to go with that right now. For That's that fine. right now. That's yeah. a great answer. And by the way, uh, just superficially, uh, there ain't too many uh, of your generation who would answer that. I, I think that... Of, uh, for yeah. lack of who the hell's Woody Guthrie. Yeah. And we're seeing a renaissance in, um, in the folk... We're going to talk about that. Uh, it's on my little list to talk to you about in, in a second. Oh. Um, and, and, well, um, let's jump right into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, of all the things, uh, of all the subjects in the world, uh, and, and, I, um, I, and when you and I chatted in, in December just to get to know each other, and you told me about your affectation with <laughs> folk music, which blew me away because that's all I listened to to this day uh and if there's one thing that my son and i don't uh it's that my, you know he's his music is so much broader and when he's here it's all he gets to listen to his folk music so um wh why are you studying and, and care about folk music so pre-covid you know the the bc days before covid um, I was um, doing a little foray into music journalism, which is something that I'm not very invested in. I I typically focus on my journalism stuff like uh, politics, economics, you know, all that fun stuff that you like to bring up at the dinner table during Christmas. Um, so I figured I would... I noticed that there's a resurgence of folk music in the most recent years. And I was creating an article about the revival of folk in the Northeast, in New York, New Jersey. And there really has been, and lucky for me, COVID has really sparked a resurgence tenfold because... Um, over quarantine, a lot of people have, with their time, been looking up uh, and discovering their political ideologies, which is very intertwined with folk music. Uh, folk music was originally, as you know, by, uh, this is just for everybody listening, I guess, uh, because you and I both know this, was created by the people. It was by the working people, the coal miners, the, the union workers, the laborers, and uh that was generally very left-leaning in terms of today's terms and over quarantine people have sort of delved more into their own political ideologies and have started thinking like oh i'm gonna start reading liberal theory or i'm gonna start reading uh about why unions are so prevalent or why are they even hated now for some uh, groups of people in the country? 
And that really correlates with folk music. You had people like Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger, who were very, very vocal unionists. Um, Woody Guthrie was a communist. Pete Seeger was a self-proclaimed socialist. And it's really interesting seeing a lot more people starting to shift to listen to more of that music. And before, uh, this is actually the exact day before uh, the quarantine went into effect in uh, New Jersey, I was at a, um, a sing-along in Brooklyn where it was a get-together for folk musicians. Mm-hmm. Everybody had their, there was banjos, there was uh, guitars, it was, it was a beautiful medley of bluegrass and all that fun stuff. And there were so many young people there that I didn't expect that. And people could say, oh, is that just the sign of Brooklyn getting a little more gentrified? But it was just genuinely people of all races, of all creeds, of all backgrounds coming to sing folk music. So they were singing things like Joan Baez. They were singing Peter, Paul, and Mary. We had people singing sea shanties. It was, and since I've seen in the last few weeks in my research that social media has also been a very big part in kickstarting these trends. Um, Just this week, um, sea shanty was trending on tiktok which is now one of the which is for people under the age of 30 is the largest wow form of social media right now wow it's the number one app in the app store and it's used internationally it was the it was trending at like number like two or three i think and people are singing sea shanties online now people are singing Uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary online. It's really interesting, I think, because it shows this sort of change in values and in um, kind of going back to tradition, which which I would have never expected. I just thought like, hey, I like this music. I'm going to research a little bit. People are, there's like three or four artists that have gotten popular in this area. But then I discovered like there's so many subgenres of folk that have popped up. You have uh, folk punk, which is uh, has grown massively, massively uh, in recent years. Uh, there's communities online which are just solely people sharing their own music, and it's it's like the lyrics of of uh, that you'd hear from like the 40s, 50s, 60s, but with people from today with this own type of grunge to it, kind of. And it's fantastic. I think it's fantastic. It's exposing people to a whole new thing. You And there's groups which have gotten very popular from it. And it's kind of inspired a brand new generation of folk music. There's people who are... Uh, going back to train hopping like the like the hobos did there's people going cross country on amtrak hopping on the back of the train or riding on the inside the coal trains and it's i think it's completely novel this is completely novel we haven't seen something like this before i think you have like groups adopting certain music tastes like like um like rock music being adopted from um from black blues singers and um kind of evolving out of that but you're seeing the sort of gapped evolution so like there was folk music kind of fizzled out towards the 70s kind of like 75 76 is when it started fizzling out you still yeah. have voices like bob dylan and stuff like yeah. that but he went electric you know, and he he, he he went electric and that kind of killed yeah his and it kind of just fizzled and then you didn't really hear about it you had people singing uh you are my sunshine and uh little boxes and stuff like that but other than that you didn't have much and then out of nowhere there was this huge resurgence of these 
vagabonds from the Midwest who picked up a banjo and a, a washboard and started making folk music in different ways. And now they're starting to go electric and become more prominent. And these people are now getting signed to record labels. These people are now being played on the radio. Yeah. And this is kind of the advent of social media. This wouldn't have happened if there wasn't social media. Of course I think. Not. Because just like good journalism, the only good music is paid music. People, like music is going to be made. Folk music is the music of the poor people, of the working people. You don't see a rich man at the top of the world, at the 1%, making musics about how he, he's, his hands are callous from working all day. It's the people that work under him. It's the people that work for the people that work for him. And I think that lends its place to our current like economy with COVID. People don't have time. And they don't have money so they're making music and selling it online and they're starting to realize that there's kind of a, a career in this there it's not just the buskers you see on the side of the the street anymore which i've met a lot of, a lot of those buskers i used to listen to on the, the streets i follow them on spotify now right. and right. like you see people donating on Bandcamp. You see people donating on this for like on Etsy for uh, merchandise, so it goes straight to them. So it's only starting to get larger and larger, and I think that's fascinating. Especially me, because uh, I'm I'm so still into folk. Uh, one of my biggest thrills a couple of years ago was getting a chance to, to sit down and, and, and chat with um, Peter Yarrow. Mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, um, and it's great because he kind of held my hands and I told him <laughs> much. I mean, I, I went, it, interestingly, I went to one of their first concerts back really? in Ohio. Yeah. One of their earlier concerts in, in Toledo, Ohio, in the early 60s. And then I actually went to one of their last mm -hmm. concerts. Um, Mary was very sick, and they actually wheeled yeah. her out uh, in, in a wheelchair. And mm -hmm. she had oxygen snaked up. It was at the State Theater in New Brunswick. Um, and and, and uh, I wanted to see them so bad, I went for the Bucks. And sat in the first row, which I'd never done before. So uh, when I saw Peter, I said, "You know, I went to one of your first and one of your last." Um, he was kind of moved by that, and he kind of held my hands. It was, was kind of moving. So um, we could talk about folk music. Yeah, you can go. I go on for days. I've been doing research on this since oh, well, we actually, started. We really and... have to talk more about it. Not now, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, Kind of, uh, kind of. Um, do you have a, an opinion? Uh, I, I always like to get young opinion uh, on the state of journalism today. So the current state of journalism is in an interesting place, and it's always an interesting place. That's the thing about journalism; it's always an interesting place. And like I said before, the only good journalism you'll get is paid journalism, and with internet journalism a lot of it has become unpaid and a lot of journalists i know a lot of friends i know are working two or three jobs to and yet are still journalists so it is a hundred percent a labor of love and it's wanting to do it for to find out the truth of something and so that's why i think that it's in a very interesting place because you have a lot of people now who didn't have any intention of going to journalism, but people who were covering the Black Lives Matter uh, protests, people slapped on the GoPro and they reported them live. And that's, that's journalism. You have these people like around my age who are creating their own little online news stations on Twitch and Facebook and YouTube where they're live broadcasting these events that are happening. Um, just yesterday, 
or two days ago, um, there was a uh, union. There's the union protest happening in Hudson Point in uh, the Bronx. Yeah. With um, the vegetables and fruit. And, yeah. Yeah. And there's people that are. It's not CNN reporting it. I mean, there there is there are large networks reporting it, but there's a lot of people like that I would that I know who are going there and doing their own newscasts and they're the ones that are starting to gain a lot more prominence and given social media's like ease of access so many more people are going into it you have uh creators on tiktok who are becoming tiktok news anchors wow. providing news for just like um any other journalist on tv would you have uh, people that cover exclusively riots, they slap on the, the live camera and they go in and they interview people. And they're starting to gain more prominence, which I think is a very interesting place. It is. As, a, somebody, as somebody in broadcast and who has worked in broadcast since I started working in broadcast my freshman year of high school is when I first started learning how to do it. I started my own company with my friend and we went across the country creating broadcasts for audiences of thousands to tens of thousands and it's really kind of interesting where we are right now covid hasn't covid's definitely helped with this sorry it definitely has helped with this because it's hard to find a job it is hard to find a job right now and whatever jobs you can find good luck finding one that's paying enough so it's heartening to see people my age taking matters into their own hands and creating citizen journalism and that's the type of journalism i think that isn't shown enough you know you kind of have like the bird's eye view of what's happening like there's oh there was the inauguration that's a perfect thing there's an inauguration that's a big event but there's not people to enough people talking about smaller events that affect local people and you have news deserts which have sprouted up across the country where there's such a lack of news that there is no news like some random place in I'm not generalizing i'm just thinking the first place that comes to my oklahoma just for example think of a place there where there's no news there people aren't getting information about what's happening there so they're relying on people from their town and companies like facebook have started uh, noticing that and they started providing grants to uh small towns and wow. uh people who are starting their own local newspapers because a acquisition after acquisition you have these large news conglomerates which have uh kind of absorbed everything and while that's good for keeping journalism you know in the industry i don't have any problems with like companies like usa today or gannett or like anything else i have no problems with that the problem i have is that news isn't profitable enough by itself in print that some areas are just becoming desolate news deserts and I think that's something that is slowly becoming more addressed, especially because of COVID, because local news is very important. Finding out like how many cases of COVID there are in your community or um, even the, um, like the, the news blotters that you'd see in your local paper. While it wasn't something like, um, like, drastic it's nice to see like what's happening in your town what's happening to your neighbors not kind of like the gossip boy but just to know like it was there there was a break in uh two houses down from me i should lock my doors there's um there's covid there's 100 covid cases in my town of a thousand i should order in instead of go out tonight and that's what I think needs to be addressed. I think that local news needs to have 
more of an important citizen journalism is eventually leading to that, I think, in its current state of because people are becoming more attached to Facebook and online community groups that are town-based. What I'm trying to do with this is in some small way to try to change um, to try to change a, a delivery of, of information mm -hmm. to expose uh, people like yourself who's doing such creative, interesting Anyway, I, I subscribe to that, and and you know what, um, we we we've, we've done our thing for now. We could, yep. we could go on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we could go on and on and on. Uh, it, it's never ending because I have such an interest, and and I know your world, Valila, is going to change and evolve so dramatically and so importantly. And yep. so we're going to leave that. Yep. Um, and, and what I did say before we went on air, and I'll just repeat it, uh, um, we're, we're brothers in journalism uh, at Rutgers. And, uh, so as you come up with content and ideas and things, uh, there's a little bit of a platform here. Um, I'm here for you, and which means I, I hope... I'm sliding over to the, um, I'm sliding over. So uh, I, I want to thank you for this, for your time. For your thank passion, you. No, no problem. Thank energy, you for having me. Uh, for uh, your willingness and, and actually for talking about folk music with me because that's, uh, my son hasn't done that in 30 years. <laughs> so, but anyway, I, I can't thank you enough to be continued. You know, to be yes. continued this dialogue to be continued because I, I i think it has so much worth and merit uh and and uh it, it, it for me thrilling to talk to uh, a young journalist with so much passion and that's the thing about like about journalism and folk music it's the voice of the people and that's why i think that it's important and that's why i love talking to people about it because there's it's not going to go anywhere unless it's known and yeah. eventually it's it will be known the voice of the people and it's it will better. be known <laughs> so we're going to sign off uh yep. again to be continued uh and and i can't thank you enough and thank you for having me and have a wonderful semester and you and i will talk yes we will thank you Bilal. all right thank you so much everybody thank you